correctly. You guys got to let me know if I sound okay. Um, someone says no sound. That's not good. Um, let me know if there's no sound. But I have sound on my end. So I want to make 100% sure that nothing is clicked. Are we good? Are we good? Let me know before I continue. All says pretty good here. Um, let, me, let, me, let me just wait a second to make 100% sure. Okay, good. So the sound is good. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I totally like lost my train of thought. But anyways, um, the road to 200, yes, that's what it's all about. So um, what is the road to 200? It's basically my journey in this year to uh, you know attain 200 super high quality listings and the, the kind of quality listings that keep us energized to be eBayers and to have a lot of fun. I really do not ever wanna exceed more than 16 hours on this project a week. Um, and basically the road to 200 means 200 items yielding a good profit of about 50 bucks or more per item, okay? So now like every time that I go sourcing, everything that I'm looking at has to kind of fall within those um, those realms, right? And if it doesn't fall within, fall within those realms, it better be a super fast flip that I'm willing to break my uh, you know habits for. But this the whole entire reason why I'm doing this is to keep everything high energy, um, to not spend all day like sourcing and thrifting and to really see how how little time I can invest in this project to eke out the most maximum result. And so if everything goes right uh, with 16 hours a week, I really want to crank out somewhere between two and three grand in pure profit at the end of the month. So that's really the quest of Road to 200. It's a lot of fun. I still love thrifting, still love going to garage sales and the garage sale season's about to be freaking amazing here in Austin, Texas. So um, I'm just gearing up for this, just using thrift stores. And I did find four really cool items today. Uh, again, um, I went for an hour and 30 minutes today right after I was working out. And it, these are places that are within about a mile and a half from my gym, maybe two miles from my gym. So a proximity game kind of thing. And anytime that's that's one of the ways that the Road to 200 thing is really going to, I think, work for me and could work for you is if you go to thrift stores with the idea of, you know, planning out a really high intense, high energy kind of route that only, you know, does maybe two hours of your time. So you can budget it in your life so you can still come home, so like, you know, spend time with the family, all that kind of stuff. Of course, if you are a full time reseller, then things are going to be a little bit different. I'm just ch chasing this thing for a part-time kind of thing. And this is only eBay with this as well. So if you watch these Road to 200 videos, you'll see that there are a couple items here and there that end up on Amazon. One of these items will probably end up on Amazon, um, which is nuts because uh, three of these items are the same exact kind of genre. And I'm restricted on two of them, but one I'm not. I don't really get it. But anyway, so one of them making one of us one of them is making it to Amazon, two are making it to eBay, and then a third is gonna make it to eBay, which is really neat because the third one's totally different than the other one. So all right, so let's start off uh, at a Goodwill. I was at today, you know, the bins are out, and anytime that you're at a Goodwill or Savers, they have these like carts that come out of the back, and typically someone pushes the cart out and um, they take stuff from the cart to designated areas of the store to just start merchandise or I guess, yeah, putting it up. Like they're they're just putting it up on where it belongs in the shelves and this and that. So um I was there and I saw a cart out and I was like, wow, the cart looks pretty full with random stuff. And it kind of looked like video games at first, but I, I know better not to get uh, super excited about that kind of stuff because just, yeah, it's just really hard to find super amazing video games at thrift stores. So I went closer to the cart and I realized there are a lot of like sealed DVDs in this cart, sealed DVDs and sealed DVD sets, box sets. So that's important because when it comes down to sealed DVDs, like I'm not that excited, but when it comes to box DVD sets or audio books or something like that, okay, I get kind of excited about that. Uh, and anytime, yeah, and so it's sealed. So of course, like I'm thinking new, like there's nothing, no problems, like super low return rate. Um, and let me talk about the first one that I found. So, you know, just scan this kind of stuff. You know, you find stuff in sealed condition, whether it be a board game, whatever, you're in an electronic section, you find something sealed that's wrapped in plastic. You should probably whip out your uh, Amazon seller app and you should definitely check out the eBay barcode scanner as well, which is on the eBay app. It's the little camera on the top right corner and it'll ask you if you want to search by an image or search by a barcode. And that thing is really helpful as well. Um, in, the, in, the, in the event that you are restricted on Amazon for something, you can still barcode search something on eBay, which is really neat. But the only reason that barcode code scanner works is because when people put items in that have barcodes, um, it just kind of, you know, 
it's only finding the markets of the people that have put barcodes in. So um, it's kind of wise if you're dealing with something media related um, to also put the barcode in as well, because you might never know, you might find it again. Um, it also it always helps other media sellers um, when they're doing the barcode scanning kind of thing to show what the market is. But if you don't have any barcode in there, it's kind of hard to see relevant information. So that's something that I um, need to work on, right? Because anytime it comes to UPC or um, what's the other one, there's another other code that you have to put in um, I always just drop it down to does not apply right um, but I honestly like most of the media that I ever mess with will go to Amazon so very few ever make it to eBay and they're gonna be a couple here that will have to make it to eBay because I'm restricted on Amazon so this one I'm not restricted on Amazon on it's called my camera don't really know what the hell this thing is about but basically it's a DVD set um, it's a private eye kind of thing so my guess is it's kind of like a Columbo um, it's sealed that's good all the this thing had a sticker for 39.99 on it, like not the thrift store price, but from wherever it came from. And the person, I guess, never opened it, never watched it. Um, and this one on uh, eBay is probably going to sell for right around 50 bucks. But on Amazon, I'm not restricted on it. And there are two other sellers that are right around the $108 mark, yielding about $82 in profit once it's said and done. In DVD and video DVD, I think it's like 98K or something like that. It's not too bad. I'm going to actually go for it. It's going to be a mid to a long tail flip. But, uh, and by the way, um, basically for all the, these things I'm going to show you, I paid five bucks a piece. So kind of just so you can paint the story. You know, how much is he buying this stuff for and how much does he think he's going to sell it for? Um, I would estimate in the lowest grade, you know, possible like profit sense, this will probably yield me $75 on Amazon because it just doesn't look like a really competitive market, right? There's not very many sellers, which is good. That means people are holding out and no one's undercutting each other. So that's going to go to Amazon right there. Simple barcode scan. Thought it was pretty good. Um, Let's talk about the next one real quick. Uh, maybe you, can, maybe some of the people out there that are into sci-fi like have seen this. I've, I, you know, I kind of want to open this thing up and just start watching all of it. But then if I open it up, obviously the resale cost goes down. So this right here, we have a thing called the Outer Limits, which kind of looks like a Twilight Zone-ish uh, X Files type show. Um, let me read some of the. So there's like six DVDs in this thing. Let me read some of the the things that are on this one. It's just kind of fun. Uh, Aliens Among Us, Death and Beyond, Fantastic Androids and Robots. Mutation and Transformation, Sex and Science Fiction, Time Travel, and Infinity. Dude, does that not sound awesome or what? That just sounds great. I wish I could open this thing up and watch it all. I really do. But in this condition right here, and it had a sticker from wherever it came from for uh, $69.99. I paid $5 for this thing. And I believe if everything goes right, I should be able to sell it for right around 60 or 70 bucks. So definitely goes in line with my Road to 200 philosophy. Go check that out right there, The Outer Limits. I know I've heard of this show back in the day, but uh, I don't know what it what it aired on. I don't know if it was like USA or TBS or was it on some weird channel? Like, I don't know, but I know I heard of this show back in the day. So anyways, <laughs> college figures in the house. Um, you know what? I better, I better fast forward real quick to like the, the last part and kind of like the catchy part of this video, like must watch, must watch. Here is what you must watch. Okay. College picker tonight is going to be battling rally roots for the thrift battle number seven, all right? So we're, we're, we're coming down winners versus winners, losers versus losers, and we're gonna come down to a super thrift battle in about two or three weeks. So today we have two amazing thrifters, I can vouch for both. Uh, we have two amazing thrifters that are gonna go battle, against, battle it against each other in a five round duel. And it's just gonna be awesome, right? It's gonna be amazing. I want you to check it out. It's gonna be 7 p.m. Central, okay? 7 p.m. Central on Steve Rakin's channel called Rakin Profit. Or if you're on the Eastern time zone, you're going to want be watching it at eight o'clock. And if you're California time, it's probably five. So I want you guys to take an hour out of your time. Check out that show. Definitely smash like buttons. We need you guys to, it's, it's one of the most fastest paced shows when it comes to interaction with the crowd. So it's a lot of fun and we do live voting and uh, you get to learn 10 guaranteed, you're going to learn 10 guaranteed bolos that are really, really cool. Um, and that's coming tonight. All right. So that's the must watch thing. All right. That's going to be my, that's going to be my clickbait on this video, but uh, it's must watch for sure. And if you're watching it after the fact, you're watching this video after the fact, there's a high chance that that thrift battle number seven is already on my channel. Cause when Steve uh, Rakin airs it, I also take the video and put it on my channel as well. So, that's coming tonight. I can't wait. I don't know who's going to win. Um, both people are incredible thrifters. And by the way, College Picker, you should definitely you should definitely subscribe to College Picker's channel because he's showing 
all kinds of finds and what's sold. And he's definitely on the road to 200 thing as well as I, as am I. And uh, we're definitely working on this thing together. It's, it's kind of complicated sometimes because he's having some trouble where the items are starting to sell a little quicker than he expected. So it's hard to put the inventory back in and uh, it's a great problem to have. Right. And I can, I think I will probably have a similar problem very soon as well. Um, and I know one of the things that he's working on is purging out some of the stuff that's like sub 50 bucks. So if you watch his videos, you're still going to get some great bolos for items that will pay you maybe 10 or $20 a piece. Go check out his channel, the college picker. Okay. There, there's my rant. Um, so the outer limits, yeah, I'm gonna be listing it for around, I'll probably be listing it for a hundred bucks and then my store's on sale for 20 or 30% at any given time. Um, you know, I could probably get, I'd be happy with 60 or $70 out of it. So maybe I'll list it for 90 or something like that. But I really do wanna see the sex and science fiction DVD more than anything, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, let's talk about the other box set that I got, this one was not new. But it was really weird because when I scanned it, I was like, huh? Like, okay, what? Okay, uh, okay. let me just double check it with the eBay app. And so I got the eBay, I got the Amazon scanner out first and it yielded this like astronomically high amount. And I was like, what? That's weird. And there were a couple players in there as well, I think, you know, trying to get that price. So I was like, okay, you know, usually when you see something astronomically high on, on uh, Amazon, you kind of have to like go, okay, what's going on here? Is it only one player in the market, like, okay, so that person can put whatever price they want. Um, but if there are a couple of players in, the, players in the market, three, four, sometimes five or six, and it's all like showing high prices, okay, you probably have a decent item to uh, maybe send in. But I can't send this one in, right? This one is actually uh, restricted for me. So I have to cross check it on eBay with the, uh, with the barcode scanner, right? So I cross check this on eBay, and this turns out to be a pretty rare DVD, honestly, this rare DVD set. Um, I'm not really in the business for media or you know DVDs on eBay, but uh, you know these things, the market spoke to me, and I looked at the data, and it's like, you know what? It doesn't make any sense not to. $5 into this one right here, it's gonna be selling, my guess, somewhere between 90 and about 150-ish, something like that, like 90 and 150. I mean, it's a big spread. Um, but that's just what I think. So um, I have a, a pretty big hunch that I think the 120 mark is probably where it's going to end up. But what is it? You know, if you ha happen to find it, it's called Banachek or Banasek. I don't know what it's called. But anyways, it's a George, George Prepard's complete series, season one, season two. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, he was on, was he on A-Team or something or Mission Impossible? George Prepard was on one of these things. I can't remember. I swear he was on A-Team though. Anyways, so someone let me know, cross check my, uh, you know, cross check me on that one. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's no um, sex and science fiction on this one, so I won't be keeping it. But uh, I'm definitely going to send this one into, e I mean, so I'm going to send it in, to send it in, I'm going to send it off to whoever buys it on eBay. I'm going to try to get that 120 mark. And that's great, you know, media mail as well. I mean, hello, sign me up. So those are the three really interesting finds I found from a Goodwill. Happened to be the second, uh, let me think. It was probably the fifth stop. It was the fifth stop today. And the funny thing is these five stops that I did today, my first stop was a Savers. My second stop was a Salvation Army. No, my second stop was a Pawn Shop. Hold on, that's not even right. My first stop was a Savers. My second stop was a Goodwill. My third stop was a Pawn Shop. My fourth stop was a Salvation Army. My fifth stop was another Goodwill, all within like three miles of each other. I mean, on the same side of the highway too. So like, you can just imagine like, that's how I'm thinking about these hot shots. And that's how I can crank out a, my eyes to see a ton of items in an hour and a half. And that's what it takes, you know, for me to hit decent gold, I have to make sure to put as many items in front of my face within an hour and a half or two hours. So that's why a hot shot works. That's why routing your stuff works. Um, and that's why if you stay high energy, it also works. So, um, so someone says, Banny Check is a great whodunit series. I watched it as a teenager. Awesome. Uh, Eric saying, uh, another great series. He was also in the A-Team. Cool. Great finds, Chris. Awesome. He was Hannibal. That's right. So he was in the A-Team. Um, he was Hannibal. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> Aaron K. Aaron Kluge from the Green Room. What's up, buddy? Saying, if thrifting is this easy, I am moving to Texas. Goodwill isn't leaving any crumbs here. Look, you just have to have a really wide range of knowledge and really try not to write off any part of the thrift store that's the most important thing like when i go into a thrift store when i go into some sometimes i'll walk through the women's section first and then the men's one i'll do different types of snaking ground cover you know strategies um but when i see something halfway interesting like my my, my phone is within two seconds of my hand like i can look something up in a split second too and um i learn a lot because i probably look up at least 
20 different things in an hour and a half, maybe 22 hour period, uh, things that I don't know about, I'll just look it up really quickly. And then the data comes up. And if the data just looks junky right away, even without filtering, like I don't have to go any more steps forward, obviously. But if I need to get some more clarification, then I can take a look at sold markets. And all these things are available in the eBay app, right? Um, so, and the uh, Amazon seller app is really awesome too, because if you find like a certain model number, it's an electronic based kind of thing, typically that that is probably where you want to send it. Um, and there's just hardly any restrictions really on used things on Amazon, except for like Logitech and some other random things here and there. It's just random really at this point. Uh, but I, I still like Amazon for uh, electronic stuff, small electronics, especially uh, when it comes to bigger electronics, like like printers and things like that. I'm thinking a little bit more eBay and definitely thinking more local on the flip. Okay, so let's talk about the other find today that came, that came from a, what did I find this thing? Oh, I came from a Goodwill. It came from my second stop of the day, all right? So the first stop was a Savers, didn't find anything there. I hunted around in a lot. Um, I did take a picture of a, a raincoat, a prime example of a strong brand, but do not buy situation. Let me show you this thing. All right, so what we have here, I'll show you the picture right up to the screen. What we have here is me pointing to a raincoat that was in a savers, okay? So that's pretty cool. And you can see the brand. I hope you can see the brand. I don't, I don't even know how to do it. So uh, it's Marmot. Okay, so just so you know, it's Marmot. Really strong brand. Um, I was going to put this on my Bonafide Hustler Facebook, but uh, there you go. So it's a Marmot raincoat. Pretty cool. I mean, strong, strong brand. If it didn't have these issues, I probably would have popped on it and it could sell for about 60 to 80 bucks. But had some issues where anytime you find these raincoats with this like rubbery type interior, it's like very, very thin plastic, like it's in the interior. So there's this raincoat again, you can barely see the interior, but here's a better shot of the interior. Let me see if I can get, oh, there we go. Much better. No glare. So it's see that interior like that. And um, I'll show you this picture like this. You can see it says Marmot right there. And then the interior, you can kind of see it in the background. So let me flip this picture right there. That's what the interior looks like. It was a $12 price tag. Um, I think I had a 10% off on me that day. So the interior is really cool, but you can see it has taped seams and stuff like that. See that that seam is taped right there, not sewn. And of course, you got to look carefully in these items because if you see right here on one of the holes that goes to one of the arms, you can see there's a tear. And honestly, these, these types of raincoats, they can be made by you know L.L. Bean. They can be made by Columbia, Marmot. Actually, I don't want to tell you any bad brands. These are terrible brands. But like North Face, all right? North Face, Arcteryx, Marmot, um, they all make a line that's very sub. Uh, it's more a little consumer friendly, right? Uh, but it's definitely on the like cheaper side. And that's these jackets right here with that interior that's kind of rubbery but it's super, super junky and it flakes all the time. And there's almost guaranteed to be a crack almost every time in there somewhere. So what the reason why I'm telling you guys this, okay, is because you have to do a search. You have to get meticulous when you see this type of interior on a raincoat. Raincoats can bring really good money, but you have to do a good scan inside the raincoat, okay? Because you are hunting for that little crack. You can see the crack right there. It's a little crack, boom, really obvious. So. Uh, didn't, I didn't buy it, obviously, and uh, it's a quest to look for crack, right? That's what I'm looking for. Just like when I pull up a Woolrich thing or something that's made out of wool, I'm on a quest to find a hole. And um, you got to remember that, right? Don't get all excited just because you found some wool thing. You have to do the proper, um, you know, strategic kind of look over. Um, so, yeah, that's what that is all about. I'm losing my train of thought totally because I want to talk about this next find. So... The second um, thrift store today, I zoom through it. Um, I'll tell you one thing I really dislike. Well, I'm just going to share this real quick. I usually don't say the word hate. I really don't like to say anything that I dislike, but there's definitely something that I dislike. And when I go thrifting for my very short period of time, you know, multiple times during the week, one thing I don't like is when thrift stores try to pack more into thrift stores and I get why they do it because the more stuff you get on the store floor, the more chances you can sell some of this stuff. I get it. But when they start putting the aisles way too close together to where a cart can barely go through, or that's the only thing that can make it through, that's annoying. But what's even more annoying is when people push their cart through halfway down the thing, they, they, I call them wedgers, right? But they seriously like just wedge a cart like right in the middle. So like nobody can walk through the aisle or anything. It's just being really selfish about the aisle. And if you're thinking, well, 
you know, it's just a cart. So they're putting clothing in the cart. Well, like walk to the end of the aisle and put your cart at the end of the aisle, like, like any normal reasonable person would do, right? It's okay to walk a little bit in your life. Like uh, wedging things in, I hate, oh, oh, I just said I hate it. So that's not good. Um, But I don't like it when people wedge things like that. And uh, it's like, the aisle should be for everyone to walk up and down, right? Like I shouldn't have to be like, and, and usually when I go down an aisle and I see one of those carts wedged like that, I just go to the next aisle and that sucks because it's like, well, why do so many people do that, right? It's easily like, a t there's a lot of people that do that and it just boggles my mind. Every time that I have a cart and I'm going around the thrift store, I strategically park the thing to where I'm not wedging somebody else, right? Because I don't own the aisles and I, I, wanna, I don't want someone to be walking halfway around the store just to get around my cart. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm weird. So anyways, um, <laughs> hold on, let me, I can show this this comment. So like this one triggered a word. When, see, let me, this is from Jock Me for FRE3, who happens to be like on all my uh, feeds, which is really cool. Uh, one thing I hate when I'm sourcing at the thrift store, when grown ass adults are removing the original price stickers and swapping them with a different price sticker. Wow, that's actually shoplifting. That's not good. Yeah, don't do it. Don't ever do that. Um, <laughs> Night required field. What's up, buddy? Saying, I seriously move people's stuff 24 7. Um, inconsiderate SOBs, Redneckerson's resales. I'm not saying be angry about this or anything like that. It's okay to dislike, you know, whatever you want to dislike. But this I find very common through the 12 years that I've been thrifting. This has never changed. And it's super, super annoying. Like, I don't care what these people are picking up. If it's furniture related, okay, maybe you have to keep the cart close and like take the furniture in. It takes a while. I get it. But it's usually, I see these kind of people in like shoe aisles and I see them in clothing aisles all the time. And it's like, they don't even take the second to even try to get their cart all the way to the side as much as possible so that people can walk up and down. They just like wedge their cart and just like, oh, it's so annoying. It's the most annoying thing. Anyway, so, all right, done. There I am. <laughs> Yeah, every see that's the thing. I can get frustrated and I can just do the same thing and not make the problem uh, solved. But I solve, you know, I, I look at that and I know what it makes me feel like, and I don't ever want someone else to feel that way. And so when I stroll a cart through a Goodwill, and I suspect that someone might be coming down the aisle and the aisle's real tight, like I will literally like put the cart into the clothes, um, you know, where the clothes are like start going sideways on their hangers because I don't want people to, to feel that they can't come through the aisle. But that's just me. Um, yeah. Okay, there's my rant. Let's talk about um, the find. Finally, let's talk about the find, right? This is for the third time around here. Let me see if I can show you this thing because clearly my, I get too sidetracked. And um, yeah, okay. So this one was found at a Goodwill, second stop today. Um, I thought it was something else. As soon as I found it, I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then I started feeling around. And I was like, oh, it's not that, but it's still good. I'm going to pick it up. It's $13 and it's this. Who wants to guess what this is? Let me show you who wants to guess what brand this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you think? What you think? What brand is that? I mean, if it's not a direct copy off what you're about to tell me, I mean, it's a really good copy. I, I got to say, because I know what the real thing feels like. We have a flagship store here in Austin, Texas for uh, <laughs> for CC Filson, which is Joe Molina. What's up, Joe Molina? Um yeah, so we have a uh, an official flagship, uh, not flagship, but just a store for CC Filson here in Austin, Texas. It's in the domain, and um, the, I've I've picked up these bags five billion times, and I know what they feel like. I, I know the accents that they use and the buckles and everything. And this one's really, really close. I mean, this one is super awesome. Thirteen dollars, extremely long tail. I'm thinking a couple things here. If I can't get around 100 bucks for this thing, then I will just end up keeping it. The interior in this bag, unlike CC Filson's bag, does have some nylon in it. And most CC Fil CC Filson's bags, they're canvas on the outside with rubber rubber with leather accents, really strong leather accents. As is this one. I mean, this one is just awesome. Um, the zippers are bigger. Okay, so that's how I knew it wasn't a CC Filson because the zipper here is a medium style zipper, but it's not a giant zipper like the ones, and it's not the bronze gold kind of zipper that you see on CC Filson things with a much larger pull tag. But still, it is an awesome like bag. Inside is nylon, it's, it's just really well built. It's canvas, and this style of bag, honestly, like it's a weekender kind of tote kind of thing. Tell me this isn't like a really good looking bag. If you're a dude, it's mostly dudeish, you know, it's a little dudeish color, let's, let's, just, let's just face it. Um, but yeah, if you're a dude and you're like wanting to achieve that like look, 
then this bag is perfect. It's a medium style bag. I want to say the dimensions, I have it up here somewhere. It's like 20, the dimensions of this bag are right here. 21, 14, 12. So, you know, it's a medium style bag, but it's the kind of bag I can just tell by the craftsmanship of it. It's going to last a really, really long time. So it's made by a brand called White Wing, which I have seen a couple times around the thrift stores, but um, they're just, uh, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to pop on um, because the road to 200 thing and everything. So um, the last white thing, white wing thing I saw was like a toiletry kit or a shaving kit, whatever. And it's a bag that's kind of like, you know, you see dudes rocking when they go to hotel rooms and they whip the bag out and they put it on the uh, bathroom counter and it has like their shaving cream, all their stuff and their toothbrush. That was made out of canvas, had leather stuff on it. I should have bought it for myself, but I didn't. Um, but I think that was like 15 bucks at a Goodwill and the comps are showing around 50. So I was like, no, not really. But this one right here, not many comps. I think one comp was around 100 bucks for the small version of this bag. So this is the medium version. I really do think, I really do think I can get about 100 bucks for this thing. So um, I, I'm, try, I'm gonna try to price it higher and I'm going to put in my keywords like similar to CC Filson or something like that. I won't call it a CC Filson. And in fact, I will make 100% sure on the brand drop uh, key, you know, to make sure it says white wing, but it's an interesting bag. I mean, it's a really good bag. So again, money found in the bag section. I've spent 13 bucks on this thing and I hope to eke out about a hundred bucks. If I can't get even close to like 70 or 60, let's say for example, then I'm not going to ship it off. I will keep this thing because it is pretty awesome. And I've always wanted a CC Filson bag, but I just don't want to spend the 300 to $500 it takes to acquire one, right? If you go to Nordstrom Rack, if you have one around you, you might be lucky to find the smaller CC Filson bags. And I think they're like $200 there, but who the hell wants a small, small bag? Like, you know, like you got to carry things around. You kind of want a medium one or a large one, right? Who They make the small one. I'm like, what kind of weekend are you going on? Like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So um, that's the other find of today. And I'm pretty proud of that one. It's pretty cool because there's a chance I might keep it, right? So anyways, um, all right, so Eric P, Eric Pierch is saying, hey, Chris, see you later at tonight's thrift battle. Yes, I will see you there. Um, Bargain Barons, what's up, man? Hey, peeps, check us out for live garage sale pick in action. That's right, and they take the camera right up in the garage sale. Check out that channel, Bargain Barons. Um, and you can actually subscribe to it right off the feed right now if you're watching it live. They're in there, just click on their avatar and it'll bring you right to their channel. So yeah, it's another bolo on another name. Alexander Manuel says, thank you for the bolo. That bag, again, is called White wing um and it's made really really well i know my bags i know bag construction it's not a junkie bag it's made well and i know whoever made it was you know very heavily inspired by the cc filson brand because this is definitely the closest i've ever seen to a cc filson bag um ever like this is the closest you'll get without spending all that money um and cc filson bags are going to be a little bit heavier i think the leather is slightly thicker but not by much but anyways it's just one of those things i think this is going to age really well whoever gets it is going to be really happy um, i'll be creating the listing probably sometime today and we'll see what that one does i think by the end of today if everything goes right it should have about 166 listings up something like that and um 20 or 30 keep in mind so 20 or 30 20 or 30 items in there are really items that i don't care about um, i'm just trying to slowly slowly purge them out for some reasonable uh you know money so that's something to be considered you know i don't want you to think oh he's at 166 he's getting close to 200 that means he's going to be at his goal no not even close so um i can't really tell if i'm at 20 or 30 percent you know with that with those junky items in there that's what i want them out is to really see when the sell-through rate you know, when the numbers come at the end of the month what are those based off of, right? And I would much rather have a great sell-through rate knowing that there's no junk in my store than have a sell-through rate that's at Target knowing that some junk totally sold and it's just not accurate, right? So I'm a very analytical kind of guy. I like numbers and numbers keep me going. Um, it keeps me challenged to keep the, you know, the goal in the forefront of my mind. Um, and it just makes me want to do these videos for you guys too, because it all comes down to numbers. Like if you're not making money, then it's not a good thing to repeat. So you have to be able to challenge yourself and go, what makes money? And what is a not, you know, what is a safe way to make money that isn't a diluted market that I can start looking for some of these things. And that's what Road to 200 videos and the playlist is going to be all about. Someone's calling me, don't know who that is. Um, that's what the playlist is all about. I hope to show you somewhere between three and five really cool finds on almost every Road to 200 video. And these finds are 
items that I have done the homework on and I've done the research on and I've done the analytical stuff on and I'm like, all right, this just makes sense. Like this is good stuff. So uh, if you can check those videos out and give them a like or give them a comment and, you know, put the playlist on repeat while you sleep, that would be awesome. Um, and you should listen to it while you sleep too, because you never know, like osmosis bona fide style uh, is definitely going to kick in. The, the cheddar osmosis will hit you one day. Um, let's talk about the... Okay, so Road to 200 sold. This is definitely some uh, stuff I've been getting comments about. Uh, you know, could you do a sold video? That'd be really cool. I think I'm gonna do my sold video, honestly, for the green room. And the sold videos are gonna be a lot different than these type of videos because these are just showing what do I think I'm gonna make. Um, you know, anticipated sold times um, and anticipated hold times and a couple other metrics. But I think it's important to do a sold video. And I want to do that for the green room. It's going to be final reflections on the item. Was it worth it? Uh, was it worth getting into for X amount of time? Where did I find it again? Because I will have all this information on a spreadsheet. So I'll be able to actually tell you like the shipping cost of everything. So I'm, I believe, and it's going to be a kind of a, it's kind of a larger project to, to undertake, but I want to do it for the green room. I want to do it for the members that have supported me behind the scenes. So uh, if you definitely want to check out the green room, um, you know, don't, don't, join because of this one sold video thing because it might take me a while to get there but um or it might take me a while to get to that sort of video and figure out the infrastructure and what's repeatable so i can keep making them but join it because you want to you know be around like-minded resellers you want to you know go to the green room meetup this summer um you, you believe in just networking in general like all that kind of stuff there's a lot of stuff resale oriented in the green room and i want you guys to check it out if you ever get a chance so i think it's a really good investment of your money and you'll definitely be on the fast track what i believe especially if you're an intermediate or a beginner you'll be on the fast track to you know at least finding really good items um let's talk about best practice road to 200 best practice i want to leave you guys with a couple things uh one of the things is I've been implementing this for at least two or three weeks now, and that is uh, an immediate schedule. Um, so let me kind of tell you, an imme immediate schedule every single day, at least Monday through Friday. So what does that mean? Um, when I wake up in the morning, it's typically 5.20 in the morning. I'm at the gym by 6.15. I'm out of the gym by 7.40, 7.45-ish. I'm at the coffee shop working on what I really you know, want to work on, certain things and certain goals and aspirations. A little bit different than reselling, totally different. It's actually fitness oriented and uh, it's green room oriented. But those things I work on for about three or four solid hours of a day, something around there, um, Monday through Friday. And then I, um, if I'm lucky enough, I might have an hour or two hours to go thrifting or something like that. So. Um, I'll go thrift really quickly in the vicinity that's like high energy, like, you know, really concise kind of uh, thrift stores and pawn shops and stuff like that. I'll do that. And then I'll come home and it's time for like make a really big meal and everything like that. I've fasted for about five or six hours and I, I make a really, really absurdly large breakfast typically. Um, even though it's right around lunchtime, but I make a really, really, really big breakfast. It's huge. And I take that breakfast and instead of sitting down and watching YouTube videos and kind of just, you know, getting lazy and whatever, I actually take that breakfast and I go to my, uh, my gym, which is in the garage. I get, I go in there with that and I put two like really long boards up on my uh, squat rack and it creates this really big table. And in that table, I process anything that needs to be sold or sent out that day to the post office man or the post guy. Um, and I make sure to take the pictures before I even air these shows right here that you're watching. I take pictures of all the items that I had found that day. And then um, I usually box up any items that I talked about in a previous show, like as in the show yesterday, for example. So there's a process going on, right? And there's a schedule going on. So I really don't get to almost enjoy certain things until I put the work in, right? I control the money and the, the funnel drip and everything like that. And that's what's important. I think a lot of people, when they buy the item, they're so like pumped up, like, this is awesome, this is awesome. And then they might not list it for like three or four days or sometimes even a week. Or if the item is lacking something, um, they need to order it or something, they might not even list it for like a month. That's a huge, like, why would you do that to your money? Why would you literally just take your money and you're like, it's going to be worth this. I know it. And you don't even get to it. Like, the Road to 200 is all about making smart decisions and being accountable and you know bringing fun back into the ebay game and not just sitting in a room for hours on end listening to your so you want to cry right it's not it's none of that it's about finding smarter items and listing fewer items that have much higher returns so that's what my goal is all about and i th i have n seen nothing but amazing things when i've implemented the schedule and after uh or during my really big 
first meal. Like I have the schedule and I bring my first meal in there and I take a couple of bites and I start working on the computer, take a couple of bites. I do measurements, take a couple of bites, shooting pictures. But either way, that only lasts about 30 minutes or so. Let me give a shout out real quick to Bubbles Brad who just paid me two bucks, got some beer money. All right, I got bona fide beer money from Bubbles Brad. Thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying the, the broadcast. Thank you. That is so cool. Um, I, I've noticed ever since I've been doing these um, Road to 200 videos, I've been getting way more super chats, which is nuts because um, yeah, I do like a good bona fide craft beer, you know what I'm saying? So thank you so much, Bubbles Brett. That really means a lot. Um, but yeah, make sure you get a schedule going on. Don't mimic my schedule or whatever, but take what I'm telling you and do it. Execute it every single day. I'm really trying to get 30 days of just like this one thing done while I'm eating my first meal. And it's just a process. And a couple other things I do while that happens, like I will not like even film these videos until... Um, I've made sure to take out all, all the trash in the house, you know, uh, make sure to tidy up a couple of rooms. Um, that way I know that when, when my wife comes home, she's happy. Like I'm happy. I've controlled the money, you know, funnel and everything like that. The money funnel is very important. Um, you might be asking, why don't you just do it at the very first part of the day if it's so important? Because there's something more important than that to me. And that's fitness and that's working out and getting your mind straight and crushing an amazing dream or goal that you want to do. And that's why I'm at a coffee shop after the gym. Monday through Friday. It's because there's a, a dream and a goal far beyond road to 200 that I want to accomplish. And so you always want to accomplish the most important things in your dreams and aspirations first in the day, as opposed to waiting later in the day. I guarantee you, if you wait later in the day, they're never going to get done. Something's going to be a little bit more important. And then before you know it, it's five o'clock. You know, if you have kids, kids are there. If you have wife, husband, they're home. Um, and then you want to kind of decompress before you go to bed. No one just goes balls to the wall until they sleep. Some people do, it's just not sustainable and it's not really a good measure of character to do that, especially if you have someone around you or a significant other. It's just not, it's not right, you know? Unless you guys are both like Shark Tank kind of people and you're forming a business together and that's what you wanna do. But that does, that's like probably 5% of the population, maybe even 1%. Most people need to decompress a little bit before going to bed. Um, I, I firmly believe that there's a good time and place for Road to 200 or the concept of Road to 200 in each of your lives out there, right? So the more that you you know, adhere to something or some sort of strategy behind your eBay store and you get down to a numbers kind of game, I think you're going to find it to be a lot more fun than what you're probably doing right now. So anyways, oh, this is a perfect uh, remark from Aaron Kluge. Um, saying, if you skip the life management, it will affect your business and productivity. That's true. So the life management is as simple as getting in a workout or walking around, you know, walking a mile up and down your neighborhood before you get anything started. There's so many ways that you can manage your life to where it can affect, in a positive sense, other realms of your life. Because it's really impossible to be good at for instance, loving somebody, if you are if you don't love yourself, you haven't taken care of yourself or any of the things that you want to get done physically, mentally. It's, it's really hard to love someone else in that scenario. It's really hard to make good money or an, another source of income when you can't control one source. You can't get down to a schedule and control one source of income. Or maybe you even hate that source of income and you're not even energetic about it. How are you supposed to take on other sources of income with energy levels being really high if you can't even tackle one? So... I see what Aaron is saying. Like you have to manage the lifestyle first. You have to get the lifestyle down before anything. And the lifestyle is going to dictate, it's going to give you a much clearer mind. It's going to tell you what's really important to you. Where do you put your time? And yeah, for me, it's the reason why I work out early in the morning. It's the reason why uh, on Saturdays, instead of me going solo and making you know twice as much money on garage sales, I, just, I choose to go with my brother. It's because I love my brother and I like interacting with him. I love filming the whole thing. I love you know, the whole aspect of garage selling, it's fun, but it's more fun with other people. So, uh, you know, call it being a social guy or whatever, but, you know, for me, it, money is important, but it's not the most important thing. Having a good relationship with your family and friends will always trump money, um, always. And fitness will always trump anything. Because if you're not fit, you don't get to have anything. Like you just don't get to have, you, you might not last long enough to have the good stuff in life. So you have to start thinking like get fit. So anyways, all right. So a little bit of a rant there. Let's talk about the, uh, so that's the best practice I wanted to talk to you guys about with the scheduling, you know, make sure that you find a good time to schedule something. If your eBay 
business is the first and most important thing that you want to curb around and you want to start chomping down some like good numbers, then make that one of the first things in your day after fitness. Always do something fitness related first, always, because you're going to find that you get to think clear quickly in the very first part of the day and it'll set up your day for success, right? Um, but if you don't get to do that, then yeah, you'll run around a little bit thinking what's most important, but fitness first, work on your business, and then don't forget about small, tiny things to show that you care for somebody else. Small, tiny, and little things. It could be as simple as a conversation. It can be as complex as a really expensive dinner or planning a vacation out. I don't know, but like, you know, do nice things for other people that you care about. It's super important. Okay. So what, what else we got here going on? Um, the show is tonight, the thrift battle number seven. I definitely want you guys to be there and uh, show your support. For, and I'm not going to pick a side. I'm not going to tell you, go, go support College Picker, go support Rally Roots. I'm going to tell you, go there and watch an amazing, amazing show that's going to go down tonight. I am confident this is going to be well worth your time. You're going to have a ton of fun. Um, the concept of thrift battle, I thought about it um, about two or three months ago. And I was like, you know what? what what's a high energy way to bring thrifting to you know, the main screen here on my channel, Raken's channel, and make it fun and a learning experience and relaxed. And I thought about, I was like, let's just have battles. Like, let's have battles and, um, you know, where people learn things and they get to interact. And I was like, this is probably the, the perfect thing to do. So that's the reason why Thrift Battle is there. And we're going to be making Thrift Battle season two after we get done with season one. And that's going to probably be done in about three weeks. Then you're going to see some sort of an open call announcement, probably on Raken's channel, my channel, even on Facebook, saying if you're interested in being in Thrift Battle season two, we definitely want to have some people from the public on there as well. Uh, I don't know how many people we're going to pick and how these brackets are going to work, but we're going to definitely get some people from the public, some prominent YouTubers to play. I want to play again. I mean, come on now. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be really, really fun to see people that you don't know about, that have zero YouTube presence, that are really good thrifters. I want to see those people. Um, this Friday, I plan to film a lifestyle show that's Q&A oriented. So if you're down for the Q&A kind of questions, you want to learn a little bit more about the lifestyle and the fitness aspect, you know, burning fat, whatever, you know, best ab exercises, um, how can I get fit when my schedule's like this, um, how would you get fit if you have kids? Great questions for the lifestyle show. So that's probably going to be Friday afternoon. Um, and now I will open it up for a Q&A for about 10 minutes, and then I'll be out of here. In fact, I have to take these two things, stick them on boxes that are in my garage, and go find the postman. It is probably 38 degrees outside. I'm going to put on four layers or so. I'm going to put on a – is it a baklava? Balaclava? I don't know. It's one of those things. I think baklava is like a dessert and a balaclava is the thing that goes around your. Okay. So that's what I'm going to be putting on. Uh, I'll have a down jacket on zipped all the way up here. I'll have awesome fleece gloves and I will definitely be on putting on something on my head because it's cold. It is cold. And if I'm lucky enough and I find the postman, I can get this stuff out of my bike because I'm going to be driving a car, riding a cargo bike. Uh, I'll be able to go to a pawn shop, which is down the road too, which I kind of want to see because I haven't seen it in like six months. So never know. I'll take my cargo back to the pawn shop. Okay. Um, Clearance Ninja says, I'd recommend you host the show. It could segue into your own TV show one day. Yeah. Me and Ray can take over uh, hosting the show. I, you know, I'm primary, I'm pretty much the primary host, but if I can't be there, which I know one of the days, February 14th, I ain't going to be on the show um, for very obvious reasons, but I do like hosting the show. It's fun keeping the flow and I completely, trust Raken to hold the show and do an amazing job because there have been times when he's hosted the show and it's just just that much more funny sometimes or it's just a different dynamic so um there'll be at least me hosting it almost every single time or Raken hosting it so and I, I love thrift battle and i think it's so much fun i learn a lot through it too and uh it, it's just interesting i don't know who's going to win tonight um comment who you think might win let me know uh okay so q a uh, thrift, flip the thrift. Hey, Chris, do you do best offers while putting your store on sale? It's a good question. Like right now I don't have best offers on. Um, I might decide to do best offers, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's enough having messages coming in every single day. Like, uh, and there are offers too. Like, would you take this? So like, this is what I have like yesterday, last night before going to bed, got an offer on, um, some film reels. And I think the film reels were like 134. Someone was like, will you take 109? I replied back, like, here's my best offer. And I could ship it to Colorado. Right. And I put 119, right. I woke up this morning, sold. Right. So I like that. 
Um, but I have a feeling if I was to do best offer, then the amount of things that I have to look at, and I know you can do auto declines and all that kind of stuff too. But I think once you do auto declines, it just has people hunting around for like, where does that number kind of stop declining? I don't, I don't think, I don't know. Like I want to, I like not having best offer right now, but it doesn't, I'm not going to say for a hundred percent certain with a hundred percent certainty that I'm not going to one day just adjust my entire blanket, my entire store with best offer. Cause I might do that. Um, so I don't do it right now, but I have done it in the past and it just opens up a lot more like, I don't know. And it's plus when there's a best offer out there, you can't alter your price either. If I, if I remember properly, if you can, if you have a best offer there, someone messages, messages, messages you, about it or messages you an offer you can't alter that listing until you respond to that offer something like that it's really annoying because if there's something wrong with your listing like you cannot get into it and alter it it gets all like white screen and white it, it whites itself out like you cannot mouse click and alter things until you get back to some people's messages which i, which I don't like so i don't know if that's still the case now but i'm pretty sure it is let me know um okay so Fireside One says, I shovel snow first thing in the morning and before bed. Dude, I've heard so many uh, reports about people having heart attacks like shoveling snow because it's like something immediately strenuous on the human body when the person's not fit and then they collapse. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just hearsay, but I swear I hear a lot of stories about stuff like that. So be careful. Um, anyways, um, <laughs> Turntable One says, yeah, Chris speaks better truth than some preachers. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, what's up, Bonafides? This is from Giancarlo. You should see the cheddar weather in San Diego, LOL. Yeah, I talk to my parents like every night and they tell me it's like unbelievable right now. Um, I will, I will be in, uh, San Diego late August and maybe the first week of September, something like that. I know for sure. There's a hundred percent. I'll be there. Um, okay. Clarence Ninja, have you ever thought about thrift battle selling the exact same item, highest profit wins? Selling the exact same item, highest profit wins. This is a good, good. So if I hear you correctly, have I ever thought about having a thrift battle selling the exact same item? Huh. Uh, give me some more. Give me some more. Um, some context on that. Let me know. Uh, Clarence Ninja says, if you've had an offer, you can't adjust later. Yeah. If you've had an offer, you cannot adjust until you respond to the offer. Something like that. Um, Rafiki Shop says it is. It is that same issue with eBay right now. If you have a best offer and someone messages you about that, you cannot make changes until the offers are out of the way or something like that. It, it's really weird. You can't adjust listings with offers. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like that. Um, Hugh G, you, said, you once said that you have an MBA. How much... Has that education helped you with thrifting and other economic decisions in your life? Would you ever, would you do it over again or was it not a worthy investment? Okay, so let's uh, rewind back to 2006 when I first had the inclination of leaving my job, my corporate job, which I took on in 2001. So five years into my corporate job, I mean, I had mastered it, I think, in the second year, but five, six years, five years in, six years in, five years in, five years into my corporate job. Actually, it was, it was a really six years in. Okay, so let's just say six years into my corporate job, like the wheels started turning and I was like, you know what? I want to do bigger things with my life. And I was getting paid really, really well. I was also thrifting at some parts of that whole thing. And I was just, you know, I was making great money, right? Had Most people in my, in my would look at my position and look at what I had and they'd just be like, dude, like you have what most people would dream to have, like, you know, like a house. And I remember in, in the garage was a Corvette one day and the garage was a freaking Jeep. There was like an Xterra one time, a supercharged one, motorcycles. Um, I had a boat. Uh, what else did I have? Not all at once, but I'm just saying some of the things that like land cruisers just had, you know, money, right. And a fair amount of disposable money. And it still wasn't enough for me. I was like, you know what? Like just having a job and working for someone else. I just, I would rather work for someone else than make a ton of money. And I think it would be really, even that much better. But I had a lot of good stuff. In fact, when my parents would be like, what do you want for Christmas? Or what do you want for my birthday? And in fact, my response was almost always, I have everything I need. Like, I don't need anything. You don't have to buy me any gifts or give me any, nothing. Like I have everything I want right now. And that was back in, you know, from the years 01 to about 06, I had everything I needed. It was great, you know? And then just something triggered. I think it was just, as, it was all the stock investing I was doing, like the swing trading I was doing behind the scenes. Um, 
I just started almost following in the footsteps of my father and he was doing a lot of swing trading back in the day. And I just nonstop in my corporate vehicle, I was putting XM, you know, satellite radio for channel. What was at the time? I don't know, 121 or something like that. It was basically uh, CNBC or sorry, the, the main like stock investing one. I don't know what it's called. I think it's called CNBC. But anyways, I was listening to that thing 20, not 24 seven, but uh, at least from eight to four o'clock in the day, like everything like Squawk Box all the way till, you know, Power Lunch and all these really and even stupid Kramer at the end. And I was listening to all these things and getting stock tips and ideas, which I would do research on. And then I would make swing trades on it. And I was doing all this stupid stuff with like a Scott trade account and this tiny little HTC diamond phone, which was like totally crappy. And I was making these trades on this tiny little crappy smartphone and um, making money, like making good money. That's one thing I, I was really always good at was swing trading. And so from there, I was like, well, you know, like I'd really like to be in the big, you know, the big leagues when it comes to money making, like an investment bank or something like that. Like I was just die hard. Like I want to go into that lifestyle. And I knew that there was like going to be intense sacrifice. So I was about to leave my job and I was like so close. I was so close. And then someone gave me the heads up like, hey, if you stick around, did you even know that they pay for an MBA program? And I didn't have a clue. And I looked into it. And within a week later, I was already consulting with my boss at the time. I was like, look, I think I'm going to go for an MBA and I had to take a GMAT and all this other random stuff. Um, I got accepted into a school here in Austin, Texas called St. Edwards University. And, you know, a couple months later, I was starting my first semester and it was paid for. So there was a lot of pressure, like it was paid for semester after semester, but I had to get a C or above for the company to reimburse full amount of the MBA program. And the MBA program at the end ended up costing about forty-three dollars to $45,000. So I thought it was an opportunity and I saw it as a huge challenge. Um, I was never good really in college with grades. I was amazing with parties and I was amazing with women, but I wasn't good with grades, right? And grades were just like not my thing. So I thought this was an opportunity for me to prove to myself that I could get amazing grades um, and I could, you know, attain an amazing job at an investment bank. And so I went forward with this. And I swear in the first semester, even the first couple weeks in the accounting classes and the, some of the, fi the initial finance classes I had to take because my focus was corporate finance. I have nearly lost it. Like I nearly lost it because they try to weed you out quickly. It's one of those programs that's like no BS. Like they try to get you out. If you're not cut for this program, they'll they'll make sure to find it within a, the first month. And I felt the pressure and it was some of the hardest times I've ever been through. And for two and a half years of my life, two and a half, two years in one semester. So actually two years and a third, right? Because there's three semesters in a year. Um, I did nothing but study <laughs> a lot. Um, every single day I was going to classes from five to about seven 30. I was in coffee shops from eight to midnight. Um, and that was every single day on the weekends before going out downtown, I would be at the coffee shop around six in the evening and I would get out of the coffee shop around 10. And then I would go with my friends downtown and drink. And that was what happened with me for at least two years and a semester. And I got I think a 3.8 average or something like almost a 4.0 and I was really, really proud of myself and it was awesome. And then they spat me out of the MBA program. As soon as I was done with the MBA program, I got my whatever diploma or masters or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to an investment bank. It's gonna be amazing. And this happened at the end of 08. And you know, if you guys know anything about finance or whatever stocks at the end of 08 was the worst time to get out of the MBA program because everyone was tightening up. Like companies were going lean and, it was impossible to find a job. It was impossible. I mean, I could have tried. It doesn't matter. Like they were not, no one was hiring, nobody. Everyone was like, holy crap, like economic collapse, like with this tightened down the company, you know, invest, banks were failing. It just, there was, there was just blood all on the horizon. And so no company with half a brain was hiring at that point. So I stepped back and I became a day trader for a while. I left my job, my corporate position, became a day trader. Now the question becomes, did I enjoy my MBA program? Yeah, I wouldn't trade it for the world because it taught me a lot of things, taught me you know, um, how, to, how to weigh projects in, in, in terms of like finance based decisions, like which ones to go with versus others, you know, SWOT analysis, you know, all the kind of stuff, real time kind of stuff going into actual businesses and being able to help them. Those are some of our projects. Um, and a lot of interaction with really awesome people that I would never 
Take Back, uh, one of them I dated. Um, <laughs> but it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Once you get in the routine and you know and you have a goal ahead of you, then it was just a lot of fun. Would I ever go back and say it's worth it or not worth it? It was worth it to me because it taught me a lot. It taught me that I could do anything. Um, it, it proved to me that I could do anything that I wanted, including reverse you know, my bad grades kind of college and high school career kind of thing. So that was basically the MBA school. So much fun. I even kept some of the books for myself. There at least, I kept at least a third of my books um, to remind myself like what I'd been through because it was just really, really hard. Um, and I kept them because I wanted to restudy them one day actually. So that's the reason why I kept them. Um, and I think it was, yeah, it's definitely worth it. It's awesome. Um, now, nowadays, it might be a better idea to get an MBA. But now, it's like I could go back into the workforce and all that. But from what I've gathered, what I've learned, what I know, it's just not for me. So that's just me. So anyways, um, Aaron Clues, can you do a technical analysis show? That'd be really cool. You know, my swing trading was actually so much more than that. It was technical. My, my day trading was technical based. My swing trading was more fundamental based. And that was dealing with companies that had track records, you know, where all the signs were pointing green, the stars were aligning. And it's like, all right, get in on the next dip. Not a big deal. So these were companies like I was in Apple, you know, sub 100. I was in all these sub splits, you know, sub before it actually split. I was in companies like, uh, what was another one I was in? But God, not applied material. There was another one. Anyways, I was in all these other companies and it just did really well. I mean, it did really well. Rackspace was one of them. Um, yeah, they were just, it was it was easy. Like it wasn't hard. Swing trading is not hard. Like uh, it's the technical trading that will get you sometimes, um, especially on the much shorter durations of trades. So you have to be very careful. The stock market will eat you up if you do not have some sort of an edge on how you do your work in the background. Everyone has to do work. You can't just, and that's the reason why I think a lot of people got blown out with cryptocurrencies because no one just, they just bought the hype, right? And when you're buying the hype, you're eating crumbs. And when you eat crumbs, you get nothing. Like in the end, you get nothing because that's what the hype's all about. It's a pump and dump. The people that have made their money do the pumping and they dump out, boom, and you are buying right when the dump, right before the dump. And you, you know, that's what we saw with the crypto market. Now, today when I was working out, I saw that the Winklevoss twins are very bullish on Bitcoin with all this regulation that's coming through from the US government, which that's interesting. But I know that the Winklevoss twins are definitely heavily invested in this kind of stuff. So maybe they're still doing the pumping and dumping thing. I don't know. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> it was just one of those headlines on CNBC this morning while I was working out. So anyways, all right, what else we got? Um, yeah, so here's something from Clarence Ninja. Should have plowed all that cash into LVS at two bucks a share. You'd be a multi-millionaire now, by now. Here's the thing about us uh, day trading or stock trading in general. If you live with shoulda, woulda, coulda mentality, it's called shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? Like I should have done this, I would have done that. I could have done this. Like that mentality will only destroy you in the end. So you have to be very careful because when the signs line up and when when the stars align and when you've done your research and it's time to pull the trigger, if you're not pulling the trigger in and using your risk, the risk that you have, right? Um, because everyone's risk is different, risk tolerance. If you're not pulling the trigger with the risk tolerance that you know you have, then it doesn't matter. The trade does not matter. And if you look back at it in retrospect and go, ah, I should have done that, would have done that, or I could have done that, that's not the sign of a good trader. The sign of a good trader is somebody that pulls the trigger when the stars are aligned, when two aces come up on the poker hand, you know, or no, sorry, when, when blackjack gives you two aces, that's when you're playing poker and you get, you know, amazing high cards or amazing, whatever, um, when you just have an amazing hand, um, that's when you go all in. And so swing trading is kind of like that. When all the stars align, you kind of have to put a pretty big swing on it. Um, yeah. So coulda, woulda, shoulda, woulda, coulda. I've been told by my best day trader friends, like that is literally the worst, 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 worst thing to do. Like if you are, if you've got conviction, you got to go for it. Um, Rafiki shop. Hey, Chris, I just started selling on eBay. What is one best advice you can give me? Um, all right, here's one best advice I can give you. Study this guide right here. If you just start on eBay, study this guide, all right, and start going to garage sales and thrift stores and start trying to find the items from this guide. And then when you find the items from this guide, it doesn't mean just buy them. It means do a little bit of on the spot research and see sold markets, all right? Go to the eBay app and see what has sold in the condition of the item that you're looking at and sort by highest and see if it's worth the risk to you. 
because for me, I'm looking for $50 pure profits. Someone else that's starting out might be happy with 10 or 20. So yeah, you know, make 100% sure that you are looking at the track history of the item that you're about to buy. And if you're picking up an item that is incomplete, make sure you're looking at the track history of the item that is also incomplete. So it means you're gonna have to look a little bit further down on the sold listings to find the most incomplete ones or the broken ones. Uh, and then ones closer to the top will usually be the most mint or complete. Uh, if you're assuming that you are searching the used section, all right? So there, that, there you go. Uh, Aaron Kluge says, I went all in on the green room. Cool, man. I hope you're getting the value that you want. I, I know you're making friends in there, Aaron. I mean, I see you like every day talking, so that's cool. Um, Clarence Ninja. Um, okay, so get the guide is what Joe Molina says. Yeah, definitely get the guide. Awesome. Movie rescoring. Do I think it's safer to sell on Amazon now? You know, there's, there are many different ways you can sell on Amazon. You can retail arbitrage stuff and sell on Amazon FBA. You can bring your own stuff in there for, through wholesale. You can private label your own stuff through Amazon. There's so many uh, ways you can use Amazon to your benefit. Do I think it's safer to sell on Amazon? I think Amazon has scale. Uh, do I think it's safe to sell on it? I think it's relatively safe. Is it worth your time? That's a different story because if you are doing retail arbitrage, all sorts of things can happen while you have bought the product. It's in transit or it's in your store. Like you could get, a, you, know, you can get popped by lawyers. You can get like these little notes saying. You, you're not authorized to sell this item anymore. Now all of a sudden you have you know 50 quantity or 30 quantity of that item. You got to recall it, bring it back to your house and find a way to liquidate it. So there's some way, is it safe? It's definitely safe. Is it worth your time? That's a different story because bad things happen to people that mess with wholesale. Bad things can happen to people that mess with private label. If you don't end up in page one or two, you know, when someone's searching something and you have a private label item of that, for example, and you're not even on the first page or the second page, you know, that could be a, kind of a problem because most majority of people that search Amazon probably don't make it past page two. I know that when I go with Amazon, like I am looking at page one, like one thumb scroll, and I'm done. Like I am not looking further than that. So, and I think that I share that mentality with a lot of people out there. So, um, you know, Amazon's a great place to sell something. I think as long as it has a great market and it's heavily optimized and your pictures are great, um, I think you might do okay. But uh, I, I selectively put things in Amazon. I don't I do not do a whole lot of business on Amazon, but I selectively put items there that I know will be selling between one and about three months, usually, something like that. Um, Rafiki Shop, thanks. I've learned a lot from your videos. Awesome. Um, <laughs> um, cool. Oh, so going back to the little snow blowing thing. So Fireside says, Fireside one says, I'm pretty fit. My neighbor has a snow blower. He's going to drop. <laughs> All right, funny comment. So, um, oh yeah, he's saying his neighbor is overweight big time. He's pushing the snow blower around. He's probably not going to make it. So yeah, I mean, you'd be careful. You know, I think the highest statistics for heart attacks actually occurs in the first 10 minutes after you waking up, something like that. It's some weird statistics. So as soon as you wake up, um, that's there's a statistic out there. I swear there is where majority of heart attacks occur like or a large percentage of heart attacks occur in the first 10 minutes of waking up even if you're a fit person because um sometimes people wake up and they just start pounding down coffee sometimes people wake up stand up too fast start you know moving around too fast um and you're going from a very heavily rested state to a state of complete like you know everything firing so um you know don't just go from zero to 100 real quick like drake says just go from like zero to 10 slowly and then 10 to 20 slowly <laughs> but zero to 100 real quick will probably kill you one day for sure um yeah clarence ninja says most of the heart attacks occur monday mornings before 10 a.m i could understand that because people do not want to go back to work their hearts are pounding um they had a great weekend complete relaxation and then all of a sudden it's like back to work again you hate it you know um, okay, so that's pretty much it. 4.05 p.m. I got to get my cargo bike situated, my layers back on and everything. Hey, guys, check it out. Cheddar Weather shirt. You know, the funny thing is um, I've been seeing the, the Cheddar Weather shirt selling a little bit more. Don't know why. Uh, my Cheddar Quest one is right under it in sales. So go check it out if you're interested in getting one of these. These are really awesome, especially for garage sale season. They are blessed with good luck. But this one's in black. This is an extra large. Uh, I'm about six foot tall. I am weighing in about 200 pounds almost on the dot, maybe 202. And uh, this is what it looks like right now. And I do dry it on hot so you can see. Yeah, pretty broad shoulders, I guess. Uh, I do have this one on large as well for when I do get kind of, you know, super slim and ripped and everything. So I got double cheddar weather shirts ready for that. But this is a good, cool shirt that Glenn at Hustler Hacks made me. I'm really proud of it. And he does such amazing work. So this is the official Bonafide Hustler shirt. It says right there. I mean, that is my name. As, as far as I can tell, that's me. That's not some imposter dude. That's me. 
Um, you can go check it out down below. It's, it's one of the links down below. You can check out the other designs as well. Cheddar Quest is a really good one as well. Go check that one out. If you really want to fully support Bonafide Hustler, then you can get one that actually says the Bonafide Hustler on it. And majority of these, is, this is called the Retro Line. So I definitely wanted to get that cool like 80s vibe to it, like arcade game kind of thing. And uh, I'm just really proud of it. But I can't take all the, you know, I can't take it all because Glenn's the one that designed it for me. So um, are they unisex? I believe so. Go check it out. Um, I believe if you're a woman, you can go get it too. So um, five, thanks for the show. Oh, okay. So who is going to be there? I'm, it's my last question for you guys, all right? Last last question. Who's going to be there at Thrift Battle tonight, all right? Who's going to be there? I'm going to hang around for one minute. Who's going to be at Thrift Battle? Put a Y or an N. Let me know. Um, if you put an N, you better have a good excuse. Um, a question. Question, if I create a video of my eBay, eBay selling experience to help people and show my experience, should I be worried buyers will see how much I buy my things for? Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> no, not at all. Don't worry about that kind of stuff. You know, that's the killer of most people's amazing like goals or like just dreams or whatever. Like they let their own thoughts kind of deter them from even acting and starting and figuring out the rest of the situation. Right. So you can apply this to many things in life, but if you got a great idea or you got something that you're really jazzed up about and, um, you know, you talk about it to a family member or a friend and they all they start shooting you down, like that doesn't mean your dream sucks. It just means maybe it's not their dream, right? So if you got something that's firing you up and you want to do it, go ahead and do it and make a mistake, right? Or make a triumph, but don't let someone else take your dreams from you or an idea that you might have, right? So, you know, if you're going to make a video about eBay selling experience and help people and show your experience, should I be worried buyers will see how much I buy the things for? No, no, not at all. Not at all. All right, lots of whys, lots of whys coming in. People are saying CP is going to win. Okay, guys, I'll see you on the Thrift Battle tonight. It's going to be on Reikens' channel. What time is it? It is 4. Oh, I got a message from eBay somewhere. Someone's going to message, probably give me an offer. But uh, it's 4 o'clock. This Thrift Battle is going down three hours from the show. Of course, if you're watching this after it's not live or whatever, um, the Thrift Battle number 7 is going down tonight. Go check it out on my channel. It's going to be awesome. All right, guys, see ya.